Thank you all for coming. I'm Dan Byers. I'm the Robinson Family Director here at the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts. Um, this evening's program is co-presented with the Woodbury Poetry Room, and I want to thank our wonderful collaborators, Christina Davis and Mary Walker Graham, curators of the Woodbury Poetry Room, which is, I think, one of the most special places and institutions on campus, and we're lucky to have them just across the street. Um, so I also want to thank our staff at the Carpenter Center who organized tonight's event and who do so much to realize and shape our exhibitions and programs. So thank you to Danny Shen, our curatorial and public programs assistant, and to Kate Kelly, our communications and administrative coordinator. Shortly, I'm going to get out of the way and let Ingrid Olson deliver a proper introduction. But before I do, I want to offer my gratitude to Renee Gladman and Rosemary Waldrop, who are we are truly honored to have you here um, with us tonight, and I'll just share a little bit about their work. Uh, Renee Gladman is a writer and artist preoccupied with crossings, thresholds, and geographies as they play out at the intersections of poetry, prose, drawing, and architecture. And she's the author of 14 published works, including a cycle of novels about the city-state Ravica and its inhabitants, the Ravikians, as well as two collections of drawings prose architectures, and one long black sentence. Her most recent work, Plans for Sentences, from 2022, is a book of drawings and captions about black futurity and other choreographies of gathering. She has been awarded fellowships, artist grants, and residencies from the Radcliffe, Harvard Radcliffe Institute, Foundation for Contemporary Arts, the Lannan Foundation, and the KW Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin, amongst others, and is the recipient of the 2021 Wyndham Campbell Prize in Fiction. Rosemary Waldrop's most recent poetry books are The Nick of Time, Gap Gardening, Selected Poems, Driven to Abstraction, and Curves to the Apple, all from New Directions. Her novel, The Hanky of Pippin's Daughter, has been reissued by Dorothea Publishing Project. And her collected essays, Dissonance, if you are interested, and a K&R Waldrop reader, Keeping the Window Open, are available from U of Alabama Press and Wave Books, respectively. She has translated from the French 14 volumes of Edmond Jabez's work, as well as poetry books by Emmanuel Hocard, Jacques Robot, and from the German Friederike Mayrocker, Elke Erb, Ulfa Stoltfot, and Peter Waterhouse. I am obviously not a translator. Uh, Waldrop lives in Providence, Rhode Island, where, with Keith Waldrop, she edited Burning Deck Press. I had to twist Ingrid's arm to offer an introduction and thus steal even a fraction of the spotlight from Renee and Rosemary, so I will be brief in her introduction and just let you know that Ingrid has had major solo exhibitions at Secession in Vienna, I ate Gallery in Reykjavik, the Albright Knox in Buffalo, and a two-person exhibition with Astrid Klein at the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago. She has participated in numerous group exhibitions at institutions like the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the Jus de Palme in Paris. And I hope you have gotten to see her two exhibitions, which are upstairs here at the Carpenter Center. I'm grateful to Ingrid for bringing Renee and Rosemary's beautiful work into my orbit and for inviting them to contribute writing to her catalog, which will come out in the new year, um, and for suggesting tonight's program. So after everyone has done their reading, there'll be a Q&A here. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Ingrid. Thank you. Thank you. Um, about a week or so ago, I was sitting in the dark on the beach by, the lake, by lake Michigan, and I was eat a, eating a romantic dinner with a friend, as one does when there's a relative heat wave of nearly 75 degrees in Chicago in late October. I was talking to my friend about my predicament of how I might introduce two of my favorite writers. Even though I've read nearly every readily avail available book by both Renee Gladman and Rosemary, Rosemary Waldrop, I didn't know where to start. I don't know how to begin tonight. I circled around this problem until I realized that in some cases, and I think in this case, it feels right to actually start with the beginning of my relationship to these writers, and also to think a little bit more about this feeling or state of not knowing something. As I walked home that night, after eating dinner on the beach, I thought, what is the first book that compels you to read a second, third, or tenth book written by the same writer? The first book that a reader reads by writer isn't always and maybe as rarely the first book that the writer wrote. 
Chronology rarely has a place in encountering or choosing books. Rather, chance or serendipity, or should we say relational or relative ties, have much more to do with how books open up to us. A gift from a friend, sure, sometimes. A book indexed or referenced in another book, fairly often. And even more often, at least in my case, a nice spine that stands out against its neighbors on a tired shelf in a used bookstore or in a library always seems to find me rather than me finding it. This, is, this experience always feels like pure kismet, but it might just be nice graphic design. In the case of Rosemary Waldrop, I stumbled upon her book, Gap Gardening, in a fairly common way by wandering aimlessly through the poetry section of the Chicago Public Library in 2016. This was not long after I'd admitted to myself that I loved poetry and prose more than any other form of writing. So I went to the library with the aim of just pulling some things off the shelf and branching out of what I'd been reading previously. I pulled gaff gardening off the shelf and rolled the pages between my fingers as I do whenever I begin a book, picking a page at random, sometimes flipping all the way to the last page. Yes, I'm one of those people. When I do this, skipping ahead, the preview come, this preview comes out of context and feels like time traveling into my reading future. With gap gardening in hand, I flip to the page with Lawn of the Excluded Middle. Though it is entirely intimidating to read someone's writing out loud with them sitting right in front of me, I wanted to share a couple of my favorite excerpts. Here's an excerpt from the first part of Rosemary, Wal Rosemary Waldrop's Lawn of the Excluded Middle. <clears throat> When I say I believe that women have a soul and that its substance contains two carbon rings, the picture in the foreground makes it difficult to find its application back where the corridors get lost in ritual sacrifice and hidden bleeding. But the four points of the compass are equal on the lawn of the excluded middle, where full maturity of meaning takes, the, takes time the way you eat a fish, morsel by morsel, off the bone. Something that can be held in the mouth, deeply, like darkness by someone blind or the empty space I place at the center of each poem to allow penetration. I put a ruler in my handbag, having heard men talk about their sex. Now we have correct measurements and a stickiness between collar and neck. It is one thing to insert yourself into a mirror, but quite another to get your image out again and have your errors pass for objectivity. Vitreous, as in humor. A change in perspective is caused by the ciliary muscle, but need not be conciliatory. Still, the eye is a camera, room for everything that is to enter, like the cylinder, cylinder called the satisfaction of hollow space. Only language grows such grass green grass. <clears throat> I read that first page, and right where I stood, I sat down in the middle of the aisle to keep reading. I was in awe. Her writing perfectly encapsulated so much of what I was coming to learn about my own, own way of seeing and thinking. That a phrase can mean two things, that something can be suggested to be seen as something other than what it actually is, or is supposed to be. The beauty of poetry, and particularly Rosemary's, is the capacity to throw us hard into both simultaneously believing in and questioning the multiplicity of the things and ideas described, and also the mutability of the words themselves. This was the first time I went in depth with the writer. I borrowed a few books at first and then started buying every book I could find of hers. If I could pick a favorite poem today, it would be different than yesterday or tomorrow probably. But recently, her poem, Nothing is Round, has proven important to me. This poem was included in the book, Driven to Abstraction. And here's an, an excerpt. The Babylonians mimicked empty space by empty space, absence by absence, so that one one said 11, and one space one, 101. But this gap was an inside job, and had to be framed by numerals, just as a pause in music must be framed by sounds. Left on its own, it floats off into emptiness. Zero knots its shape around a void, a hole a man may fall into if he can't see straight. Ring, circle, vicious, loop that separates in from out, and is also the egg, hence generation, all and nothing in one pregnant contradiction. This poem puts a frame around supposedly empty space. It points to the marker of nothing so that we can recognize that nothing is there. 
To know something is missing means you see it's missing and also you have framed the space around it. And also that a whole might not be an absence, but rather a presence depending on where you're standing. Water break. <clears throat> My infectious need to read anything and everything by writers continued with Renee Gladman. I was introduced to Renee's work when she was asked to speak at the Renaissance Society in Chicago during an exhibition of mine in 2017. The programming at that institution is usually somewhat tangential, a few degrees removed from the artist's direct references, but nonetheless entirely related. And for me, Renee Gladman felt fatefully paired. Having not read anything by Renee at the time, I searched for and found a copy of Calamities. I'd never read a book like it. The repetition in this publication stirred a common problem I have when reading. An image and idea is so exciting to me that my mind wanders while my eyes are still moving, but my mind has ceased to comprehend the words on the page. When I realize I've gotten off track, I back up and start again, rereading each page. Each page or so of Calamity starts with a repetition, but the difference in the divergence after the first phrase is the activity of the book. The repetitions all follow the phrase, I began the day. Some examples of these beginnings. <clears throat> I began the day having given myself the task of compiling a list. I began the day asking individuals of this group of my ex-lovers to map a problem of space, but not the problem that involved the anxiety of whether they could or could not draw, nor the one that asked how it was even possible to translate problems into lines. Rather, I meant real problems where you had to think about where you were in a defined space and what your purpose, for, purpose was for being there. I began the day in an audience lifting my feet from the floor one at a time in recognition of something. I began the day in an embrace. I began the day standing at a threshold of time, the beginning of something, the end of something. While I was reading this book, at least once a page, I became excitedly distracted by something and my mind would wander. And I would have to reread Renee's repetitions repeatedly. It was like some sort of possession being forced to enact a parallel activity to the written repetitions that structured each page. After reading Calamities, I appropriately titled, I read to after that, Tof. This book about writing a book was just another moment of feeling in sync with Renee's work. The reflexive meta-subject, the making of the book as the subject of the book, felt like a familiar oscillation to me, to be in the image, making the image, and also looking in on the image from the outside. This mise in a beam of making something about making something. Here's one of my favorite excerpts from To After That. When I realized that I was starting, oh, when I was, when I realized I was staring over the shoulder of an early staring over the shoulder, I asked my friend about it and she recommended this surcease. Since page one, I've been writing myself into a book that already bore me. And now, nearing its end, I have multiplied myself again. I'm writing about the writing about the writing of this long ago book. Hundreds of sheets of novella crowd this room. I'm sleepless and cold and warm and walking through all the time that does not write this book. I'm full of overlapping views. This looking over Carla's shoulder, I feel I have been standing here for most of my life. How amazing it is to think that everything from that world will vanish and this book will finish the other one. Many desks and chairs will be thrown into the closet. The ghost of this book, still not free, will move on to the next emerging novel. I will have closed the book. I close it. I usually read to f in order to feel that feeling of unknowing. I read to elicit that moment of distracted reading, the moment I have to go back and reread what my eyes have already passed over. I'm drawn to read things that send my mind in all directions, exploding out from what I'm supposed to be reading. I often think of the way that I read as a photographic act. The way a phrase, word, page, or structure strikes me as I, re as I read something is not dissimilar from an object, a gesture, raking light, that might inspire me to stop what I'm doing and take an image with a camera. The moment my mind wanders, I take an image from a text. And what I mean by that is that I excerpt it. I pull out a pen or my phone, and I take the words down as a note, as though I were taking a photograph. Like capturing a photographic image, an excerpt or quote pulls a phrase out of its given context. 
Some people have called photography violent for its ability to crop in this way. Taking things out of context can, sometimes does, often does, change the meaning of the image or phrase. Sometimes it's a minor change, sometimes it's totally destructive. I think of it more so as a zooming in, in my case. Something like the way a catatonic daydream feels. Pulling a part out and focusing on that part to help me better see the whole. And usually it helps me to see a more complex whole. The photographic excerpting is my way of ex explicating a text. Some readers might want to interrogate a text, dissecting the contextual meaning or the historical or canonical importance. And the reference is inferred by what a writer writes. I'd selfishly rather be excited by it and look so hard that I turn it inside out. Or maybe a better metaphor might be that I'd rather unravel the book thread by thread. But like a sweater unraveled, when you've unraveled it, it's either one of two things. It's either not a sweater anymore, or rather it might be that it's transformed into its raw state, a ball of string, something that's full of possibilities. I have endless respect for these two people. I'm endlessly excited by what they write, and I'm so grateful to have read what you've written and thrilled to hear what you both have to share tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Is this good? Do you feel it in your soul, my voice? Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, this is a really uh, incredible um, opportunity for me. Uh, and um, I feel like I could just spend my time for reading, just talking about all the special sort of connections between um, uh, my work and, and Ingrid's work and how I thought about it and how it, it's um, moved me, my 30-year love of Rosemary Waldrop's work and her presence, and I'll actually say more about that later on. But um, I'm, just, I'm just really excited. I love the, uh, I just feel like when you, when you bring uh, art, uh, visual art, photography, uh, music, writing together, really amazing things happen. I love the way that the, the, the thresholds between the, the, the different fields get uh, sort of energized. And, um, and, and it was really exciting to be invited to write a piece for Ingrid's show, which I hope you all have seen. And I, I wanna start by um, reading that piece. And um, is that straight now? No, just leave it alone. Okay, fine. Um, so the, the, the past 10 years I've been doing a lot of uh, my own visual art, which is drawing and doing a kind of drawing that looks like writing and, and is also a kind of writing. Uh, but I also have been doing uh, writing pieces similar to the one that I'm gonna read for visual artists, either for monologues or for shows. And, and um, so uh, what's really exciting to me is just that that field becomes this sort of like ever shifting um, place that I think that I've always kind of desired where um, there's just feels like there's a lot of movement going through the page or through the sentences, a lot of change and shifting. Uh, so you'll see that there's a, or hear that there's a, there's a, a, a lot of repetition and um, and I don't know if I should say maybe like don't try to always follow it um, linearly because you might get really tired, um, but maybe just sort of experience all these pieces as a uh, atmosphere. Um, so I'm gonna read the piece for Ingrid, uh, an interlude of pieces from a book called On a Potova Crosses a Bridge, which is a the third novel in my Ravika series, but it's a lot about writing and architecture and friendship. Uh, and then I want to read a, another piece which is about sort of uh, drawing and writing and community uh, that has um, quotes from a lot of different writers um, and then uh, finish up with, with something short um, that I'll tell you about later. Um, okay, so this first piece 
is cloud frame framing. Such that when I'd taken the object I'd made and folded it into my wandering, then placed my wandering on top of my fold and folded in your wandering, shot through with an overcast of green and held it in a time lapse, light framing, scattered light. I realized 467 things about architecture. Architecture was a form of thought that divided itself into questions of framing and questions of capacity, and it had color in its background. It was an overcast of green when it was telling. It was a washed out gray when it rose. It was a soft pink in its hollows. Whenever I was building, I was also folding, and folding was the cutting of space into corners and spreads. A spread was the laying out of legs and light. It was a lateral stringing of something curved, something wanting porcelain, something resinous, hard and flying above. Building was laying something out, then laying something above and turning it. It was orienting your frames and flatness and making folds at your center. You could be a hanging resinous thing. You could be a curving, a long feminine, a feminine fold with light scattered across the overcast green floor. When I was building, I held two things side by side. I had two things I wanted and a third I'd forgotten, a fourth that was soft pink, a fifth that was folded a sixth suspended reciprocal. I had one thing I was fixing and another resinous thing that held. I had my invisible architectures to consider and the breath it took to construct them. I was laying something out and turning. I was laying something over and framing. I needed to lay something in, something blurred and indisposed, something cut but also moving. Building was holding something moving in a time lapse that became your home. We were living in what we were seeing and making objects, things slightly amethyst in color, things slightly amber, some things deep hollow pink straining in red. Objects were interruptions in space that went flat when you talked about them. Space was something cut that opened something glowing. It was all that glowing gray full of elements. The days I spent laying something in your hands, overcast in color, blurred and green and wanting. I wanted to build without a perimeter, bodies flowing. I wanted a feminine future architecture that would suspend your knowing, be a reciprocal fixture, be something hard and curved, folded into folds. Legs would bisect your folds, folds against my fold green would come down, but this would be when I was building something empty or something layered with something shaped of. It was when the numbers were multiples of breathing squared and cubed to your knowing. You were building with light materials, with some knowing and some non-knowing, and wanted shutters and wanted vertical posts and a balcony. I wanted a green floor overcast and feeling a pool of enfolded curves and questions with pockets of white empty, white to gray, with a blurring afterthought, an ancillary building, such that I made an object hollowed out in pink, rough and absent at its edges, then turned it. When I turned it, I found another object beneath it, a version similar to what I had made and already turned, but also different, crucially, a warm vanishing yellow in its hollows. I saw something turning in my turning that didn't belong to me and understood the 468th thing. I was building something that did its own building and when it wanted mine to lie on top of its and to turn in an overcast accord, something dark inside, something glowing, some vertical stringing becoming suspended, resinous in intent, two places sliding against becoming open, rotating architectures. Architecture was glowing. It was something cut and hollowed and folded. It rose and strung itself and turned when you felt it. I counted something pink in the hollows. I counted something bright and yellow. I counted long rectangular intervals of gray, 
warm gray and empty gray. I realized that when I was building, I was looking too far down into something reciprocal and kept building into my structure something hidden, something stringing. The things that curved were surfaces turning, interrupted by time. They hung in the vestibule. They made a reciprocal fixture for your seeing and glowed in an absence of color. We looked for something brightly dark to put next to something absent. We made a place for your folds in the dark and let your legs hang. It was a place for living and a place for thinking. We wanted to look down at living through your legs and find shadows behind the turning. I saw a woman rewriting living as I was building. I wanted to bring her home. I wanted to make a home of something amber and something shuttered, framing something dark and glowing, vibrating around something empty. Building was trying to breathe and see at once, then turning with your hands and turning with your materials. It was a repeated hollowing and filling and standing back to see, standing tall and looking down at your curving, at your suspension, your fixtures. You had to make a place for invisibility, so you built in overcast and blurred your edges and dropped intervals into your flooring. It was a green going gray. It was a yellow going pink. Something lay on top of something in a question of framing, a duration of time laid against another duration of time. I said this and kept saying it because this was how you got to the future of building. You had to repeat your non-knowing that formed the gaps between your numbers and your beams. You had to keep saying that you were turning in order to see what you had built. The body was always implicated, always needed, and wanted a hollow for where it folded, and wanted an infinite, invisible depth, depth where it was strung. And that is when I saw for a moment what light saw, how it shattered and turned itself in a framing of bodies and color, how it made fractures to heal fractures and let darkness give it dimension, let itself be woven with the hidden. I built through a glowing dark, reciprocally fixed on blurring, reciprocally framed and strung, exceeding the afterward, the 469th thing. Thank you. Okay. This is the interlude. I wrote a book about a group of friends surviving a crisis, and then the book became my life. I named it once I realized this was happening, once I saw that I was writing on the previous day the script of the subsequent day in terms of who I saw and what I thought as I moved through the city. Once I saw this, I named the book and made it so that the life I was writing was also the life I had lived. It wouldn't just go one way. It wouldn't just be that I was living what I had written. I had to live in order to write, and I had to meet my friends and receive their writing in order to write. And they needed to see me write in order to go on writing. And we all needed to sit in that cafe and wait out this crisis that was taking away all the other writers. And not just the writers, but also the bus drivers and Bellows students and the people who wrote the trains and the audiences for our readings. I named the book that had become my life after the events of my life so that there would be no distinction. There was no distinction in my living. There was no break between days. You went to sleep, your body rested, but nothing changed. You woke into the same circling terrain of the city the same buildings wandering and knocking into each other and knocking houses down, but nothing falling and no plaster coming off, just waddling and knocking and stumping buildings, looking all the time normal, but being absolutely unconventional in form. I wrote a book where after every sentence, I or my character or an object in the room disappeared the book grew into 542 pages, which surprised everyone. A book where it was not right to add periods, where you couldn't partition with commas or ellipses, where you couldn't vanish by telling people you were vanishing. 
you dissolved, you cut, you cleaved. It was a book in which I recognized a companion text, one that would hold everything this book was erasing. I would have to write this book as well, but not in this room, not on this hill. I felt I'd, I felt I'd have to go somewhere new in order to see it, into a world that could hold the things I was missing and Luswage was missing and everyone. The book I'd have to write would not take over the world as our current books did, but would just be a kind of archway, a beginning. I wrote a sentence and downtown was gone. The last building stood up and walked away, the fourth since that morning. I wrote a sentence to replace the building. Everything that vanished got replaced, at least in the book I was writing. But its space in the object world remained empty. A new object vanished. I was still writing. The books between us made a curved surface of the table when we gathered them that morning and placed each one with purpose in a heap, our books, all that we had written. We lay our books on the table to see its surface curve and see the books fall in and fall through themselves. The surface of the table curved right before our, eye, our eyes, but not because of the weight of the books. The surface curved because the books were passing through themselves in a kind of invisible writing, a rewriting that had nothing to do with us. I dropped my book on architecture into the table to witness its self-intersection, how it would read itself, then turn itself into a new form, but not concretely, not in a way my eyes could see, yet irrevocably, and that no, no matter its return to architecture, the book would always carry that other thing within it. And though I would learn nothing about its alterity, my chemistry would ch be changed from the process being the author of this book, the author of some of the books who have fallen into the table, the table curved in anticipation of the body's self-intersection and almost made a mirror, but took our books instead. They fell through, we waited for them. Zayota scratched his head, was it the right thing for him, for his books, where he sat with them, were they even themselves and held them at a distance once they returned. The group of us walking began to rewrite the group of us sitting at the cafe, and we became something like a party in a living room, though nothing yet celebrated, but someone perhaps, though nothing yet being celebrated, but someone perhaps giving a talk and other people asking questions, or all of us sharing letters from abroad which were sometimes being translated by Siren Kuchek, though most of the time experienced as visual pieces. These were gatherings where someone showed a film and we watched a cow eating grass for 10 minutes. And after the cow left, we watched the grass, not blowing in the wind, but frozen and wet with mud. We watched a large man situate bottles across the surface of a desk, the washed out light landing where the bottles were old and his doing this again and again, making the film long. Someone fell asleep and we drew close. Tomas Bello wanted to talk about what we were seeing, but Luswaj refused him. We had taken the long walk here and had done so days in a row as this film transpired, then began again. Okay, um, this is Untitled Environments. Um, this has the same opening as the uh, Calamities essays, but this is a post-Calamity piece. I began the day wanting to bring into convergence three activities of being, what I'd seen, what I'd read, and what I'd drawn and to say about these acts how they made lines in the world that ran alongside other lines and how all these lines together made environments of the earth where I could put my body and you could put yours. And these would be lines always entwined because there was little, if anything, you could say or make without calling forth other lines. And this was how you knew you were where you were and the ground was worth cultivating and that there was life beneath the ground. 
I spent a long time looking into each of the acts of how I'd been in the world, how I conveyed that I'd been there, and I found all these overlapping currents and found that each of the acts divided into further acts, like the acts of writing and making narrative, which divided into acts of building and afforestation, which then led to sex and led to reading and wandering. I have found in drawing a way to think about narrative such that I could look into narrative without writing narrative and could see something about what it did. And I didn't have to place periods anywhere and didn't have to give details or unfold events but could be in a narrative space, a space built by narrative. And I could say this was happening because I was moving my hand across the page and I had a pen in my hand. I had a pen in my hand and for a long time or a short time I'd move it across the page and think or not think about narrative and what it meant to be a narrative, to feel narrative gather in my body and feel it work to move out of my body but I'd be making a drawing, and yet as I drew, I was often conscious of the resemblance of the lines of that drawing to those I made when I was writing. The resemblance with the sun at the bottom of the drawing page, I was trying to invert a city to suggest a dense landscape, and the presence of this sun kept me cognizant that all the time I was drawing, I was doing a kind of writing that in its duration was drawing, in its shape was writing, and narrative pulsed at the core core of all of this. The ink was the core of my narrative. My hand was the core. The shape my hand made was the core. And I knew when I was saying narrative that I wasn't limiting it to some event happening inside fiction, but rather was trying to get at an energy, a light that threaded all my acts of reading and writing and drawing and seeing into a day, then days. I have found in writing that all the women I'd read, that some of these women have pulled a line out of some moment of doing and drew that line and kept drawing it while events and time settled above it. And this line was its own kind of core and began something like, this land will always, this land will not always be foreign, Audre Lorde appearing to dream. And the line became the same as the land when you looked at it from far off, from deep inside something that flooded and was peopled, often called a poem, sometimes a march of bodies in pro protest, sometimes the single body working at a desk, standing in every other, st standing in for every other body at risk, looking out of its face, perceiving. And Nazreen Mohammadi, her body failing but sustaining this practice of laying lines Writing into her own drawing, the shadow came and stood in its place like yesterday. And the early drawings of Julie Moretu were all at once the lines in the world head for the periphery, and each departure is violent, and each exploding sight is a center with a microarchitecture inside that pulses like all centers pulse, responding to the megastructures of the previous layers each center being a book burning at the core of the earth. Janice Lee's single moment during the darkness that opened the morning of my writing, where I could see the histories of the words I was combining, could see the ground they covered, could hear them resonating in the material of that writing, the sounds coming off the dark, the dark in their faces, the language is having to break in order for these words to appear, to flow like they're searching for something illuminated from within. Janice's figure kneeling in the alleyway between worlds. Danielle Vogel's harvesting of water from mouth to ink. Simmering gills becoming invisible like wind. We were suspended in time still talking to Virginia Woolf, still searching for Zora Neale Hurston, wanting to empty Woolf's words of their racism, wanting to be loved by Stein. I had been up all night writing. I had been reading all my life and shaped in my writing these places where lines had been laid out and were woven in with the earth. I began drawing what I read and saw Mira Schindel's oily architectures and saw Gagel's knots and found in Agnes Martin a picture of our breathing and stood in awe of Toba Kadiri's endless windows, each artist nesting a book in the floor, always a book inside some other. It was an interlocking thing, ley lines illuminated, seen only in the dark of writing, 
the line drawn out of the body through time, wanting to have been loved by Stein, wishing for Zora to have been better loved. These were the pages that settled in you when you were drawing what you'd written for such a long time. I have found in drawing that I was writing something I'd been reading, Maymay Bersenbrugge's awareness of the horizon, the breath, and the mesa. I'll wait to see what I recognize, staring into the light. I was looking for, I was looking into the moss growing between the bricks laid out in front of the door, looking into the moss as its own space, its doing beyond making a border, and the green coming back after such a long winter, bright but also mourning, the sun bearing down on it, the clouds blocking the sun, the human eyes glaring, and found within spaces that bordered some infinite writing about process and thought, some unending burrowing, some endless death and reach, some constant holding in place. Kristen Prevalet's The Poem is a State Both of Mind and Landscape, and our books burrowing inside our drawings, the lines holding the brick unyielding. I had to find in my I had found in my looking at the land that I was also looking at water. And behind me were living architectures in which I wrote and drew, and where I read about other people's writing and drawing, their mercurial habitations, Natalie Sorot's dark clusters between the dead house fronts, motionless little knots giving rise to occasional eddies, slight cloggings. Eileen Miles's standing with several hundred people, their identities changing slightly, then utterly in the course of the night. Mary Sheevis's days go by when I do nothing but underline the damp edge of myself. And these were all moments of being that became houses of the story. And these were all moments of being that became houses or the stories of houses. And this was something pooling beneath the earth, altering its body, inverting surfaces. You did your farming in your sleep. You unwrote the clothes you wore. And I had found in reading a way to draw lines from the earth and make an outline around my sitting at this table or walking the streets of any place, any large or small city, any countryside, any emptied forgotten place, any place transitioning, taping, taking on multiple identities, blaring them at once. And this was all architecture, all the reading I had done. Lynn Hagenian's open mouths of people her weather and air drawn to us to say, landscape is a moment in time. I had found in my walking the expanse of several places that through which I, sorry, I had found in my walking the expanse of several places through which I stopped repeatedly. I stopped in time and without time. I stood at the threshold of doors, at the throat of caves. I pulled windows from collapsed walls and grabbed a book to hold up the city, the barn, the balcony, and this was reading. I had already written toward Edie Fake's architectures. I had counted the Ruth Asawa sculptures hanging above me and quoted Monica Grismala three times. Ava Hess's catalog, Rosone of Drawings, where was it? Lee Bontheque, Zarina. Zarina has said, once I lived in a house of many rooms, and this was and etching, reading aggregated layers with luminous lines running between, and each line was a moment in someone where the body stood up and walked into a book, a drawing, a squat structure of doors, a tower perched on a hill into the water, and each line was a writing back of language, its response, its figurations, and all this querying at the corners, putting corners everywhere, even on top of one another. And I found in my narrative these other narratives that opened underwater, that glowed in deepest night, that you could read without alarm, that were blown out geometries, maps that were textiles hanging from the ceiling, calendula underground, always having something to do with bodies moving through other bodies. Danielle's The Book Spilled of Something takes something. Okay, um, that's exhausting. I'm sure you're exhausted too. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna close with reading uh, the last paragraph of an essay that I wrote recently for um, an anthology that's coming out soon 
um, ab about influences. So the, I think the, the general question was, um, you know, how did you become the writer that you are, or uh, what are some, uh, who are some important writers, or what are some important events that sort of set you on your way? And I, I ended up telling a story that I've I've mentioned many times when talking about writing and how I became a writer, um, but I don't think I've ever written it down before. And this um, this essay is called The Role of Philosophy, and it's about when I was a philosophy major as a college student, and um, and not a very happy one because it, uh, I sort of came into philosophy not knowing what it was. I thought it was sort of like this space where you could just think. Like, uh, you know, I describe in the essay one of my favorite moments was like when we were all like, uh, the professor had placed, uh, I think it was a spoon or a pencil on the table and we were all sort of like gazing at it. And it felt like that was one of those moments where, um, you know, you weren't having to sort of reiterate some philosopher that you'd read or some text or theory, um, but it was sort of like this moment of thinking about the, the layers or the, the pencil in space or is it there, is it in your memory or, you know, whatever came up. And um, anyway, so I, um, the point of this essay was to say that um, what saved me was in my senior year, I took a, a uh, literature class called Open to Experiment where I read um, some of the artists, that, uh, writers that I mentioned, but also um, most importantly, Rosemary Waldrop's uh, The Reproduction of Profiles, which um, just sort of blew my mind and really sort of, uh, sort of re reoriented um, that sense of, of value around uh, thinking and the day and identity and the body and feeling that those things, that there was a way for those things to exist simultaneously, which I had struggled with um, in, uh, in many, most of my philosophy classes. So I just wanted to end um, with that, this, this paragraph. Um, when I read the following sentence on the first page of Rosemary Waldrop's reproduction of profiles which had already blown my mind when I encountered the name of my favorite philosopher, Wittgenstein, on the back cover, a sighting, something locked placed inside something free I had yet to experience before. I felt I was home. She'd written, I thought I would die if my name didn't touch me or only with its very end, leaving the inside open to so many feelers like chance rain pouring down from the clouds. It was the first time I felt unequivocally in the presence of portals brought about not only through the thinking shapes that the associative phrases made when brought into proximity of one another, my name touching me, or touching me in such a way that rather than feeling it, I felt everything else in the world, but also in the way each of these words took on a vastness by nature of existing with such slipperiness in their sentence space. Each word promised an, an adventure, a setting out, and because it was happening within the realm of the ordinary, the day within a gesture of self-articulation, it was the closest I felt I'd ever been to being able to know, or preferably unknow, time, experience, and the meaning and use of language. I tried to explain this to the faculty of the philosophy department by way of my senior thesis whose title I've long forgotten, but whose objective was to posit that perhaps it was more, it would be more productive for future thinking if we relocated the questions upon which philosophy had long been riveted to the more open, responsive, and daily field of experimental poetry. They were not impressed. <laughs> the feeling was entirely mutual. <laughs> An impasse become portal. So to one of my portal figures, uh, please welcome Rosemary.
me a moment to gather all my paraphernalia here. Um, I want to join my thanks to Rene. Oh, this is okay? This is good? Um, that, that you all came, and also that the Carpenter Center had me come, and especially to Ingrid um, for allowing me to encounter her work, which I hadn't so far. And I, you know, even on this first encounter, I, I feel a great kinship, uh, especially with the tension between the body and the abstractions we all work with. Yeah. Um, I want to start out with the poem, Nothing is Round, because Danny had told me it's in the catalog, <laughs> you know. So you are, are already prepared by Ingrid's quote from it. But here comes the whole thing. Nothing is round. Nothing. Zero. Absence of things, of signs. Unnatural. Hover in the same space and look identical as twins. Point nowhere and like poems mean but what they say and are but what is not. A source of horror to some, a commonplace in our speech that juggles degree zero, zero, zero countdown, zero ground, zero sum, ga sum game, sorry, zero sum game, and zero options. But zero is not nothing not absence, not simple exclusion. A signifier with a shape that could be traced on learned dust, on wax, on paper. A body unbound by words like nihil, niente, nada, nothing, nichts, and even zilch. Like the phonemes that make language possible, neither physical nor psychological reality, but a value with an abstract and fictive importance that enables. The Babylonians mimicked empty space by empty space, absence by absence, so that one, one said 11, one space, one, 101. But this gap was an inside job, had to be framed by numerals just as a pause in music must be framed by sounds. Left on its own, it floats off into emptiness. Zero nuts its shape around a void, a hole a man may fall into if he can't see straight. Ring, circle, vicious, loop that separates in from out, and is also the egg, hence generation. All and nothing in one pregnant contradiction. As the young Elizabethan stuck his thing into her nothing, he knew the serpent swallowed its tail inside Eve's body, even before Adam knew her. And her children, begotten of nothing, are thin of substance as the air, and more inconstant than the wind that blows us from ourselves. And I'll read one more poem from that same sequence, uh, Driven to Abstraction. Well, Thought-provoking matter. Middle English grammary, grammar, or book learning came to mean, came to mean occult or magic lore. And through some, I have a little trouble seeing here. And through, and through one Scottish dialect has emerged in our present English as glamour, spell cast by women, grammar girls, with words that spell power to cast spells and provoke matter 
saw a black panther treads at my side, and above my fingers there flowed petal-like flames. Words with a nimbus, a glory, a sphere of radiance beyond the horizon called definition. But writing is the tool of, of, of the negative, through which meaning comes to us effortlessly. It burns all substance off the blue shapes in the east to a density less than thinnest cloud, the word hills. Without body, so with form. Therefore not like God, a nothing that floats on the ink plate. The word's power to kill, and I'm not thinking of White, White House memos, it's violent against what it names, what it can name only by taking away its matter reality, destroying its presence, is death itself. Or is it? If the word both kills and shows a certain slant of light on winter afternoons, that we'd search in vain anywhere else? If the word horse boils the animal down to the concept and yet in the way of hunger hallucinates four legs, a mane, a fold of flesh, then maybe this death is not a simple matter and must hold a kind of life the way fog holds light. Some say it's because the daughters of the god came down from the heavens and made it with humans that the order of the world was thrown out of joint and opposites became entangled. So that, without the letter that kills, there is no spirit to give life. And now I would like to read some more recent poems. And the first one is called The Almost Audible Passing of Time. I've been sitting so still I might be part of the garden. Time might shut down if I weren't still cultivating an edge of desire. The thirst, it spurs toward the region of expectation. The way a hungry baby stretches its arm toward its mother's breast. Or the cat keeps eyeing the grackles, black as if already night. A pale moon hangs ready for her cue. For her cue. So shallow sunlight is still sinking through the air. The future. Surprising we can think of it. Its uncertain contours, body, mass. When the ads all announce end of season sales. The garden, in fact, lies behind me. It's nothing but an act of memory along with the dry smell of a stone wall crumbling at the point where sky and earth would come together. All our temporal concepts can be traced, it is said, to feelings of effort and fatigue, just as it takes learning and failure to become aware of our capacities. Encouraged with luck by a mother's smile, but can I look at a word as if I hadn't learned to read? We're still running through high grass, smelling the sluggish mine river mingled with distance and the lilac purple. The day old you and on, dusting, dusting sleep from bird wings. Even so, even so your nose is in your book. I can just see you roll your eyes at such silly questions. Ritual, repetition, rhyme. For centuries we've tried to thwart the arrow, but even when at the prayer of Joshua the sun stood still, time nevertheless continued. Likewise when Rousseau threw away his watch. 
staring at the mottled bark of the sycamore, do I think this ritual will protect me from the constant changes of my body? The run toward dust to dust? Is it to freeze this moment before the mosquitoes come with their cargo of itches that I watch beetles and weeds and pods as if I were interested in them? But I don't even know their name when words and their entanglements are my feelers. Without them, I'm in darkness. I search the cracks between my English and German for more words than either has, to gather gradations in softness of the late afternoon air, as if they could help my nerve impulses not to fire on the all or none, nothing principle like our elections, but to transmit even the slightest discrepancies of light, the weakest hint of an, of an insect. But even so, the leaves soften the edges of the tree. The alphabet takes many American minutes to take the place of one book. And it's the pale moon between the leaves, not a symbol, that triggers the Im image of, its, of the German farm, lost in strata of time, solar, sidereal, nuclear, where the pale light stretched out the distance and the cows chewed their cut so slowly, immeasurable by any clock. A different time, not suited to the ephemeral. No matter what comes into the house, a letter, today's paper, you are convinced you have already seen it, as if your present were being devoured by an imposter past. Whereas I look at my hands and think I've never seen those veins. True, they are more prominent now, as if asking to be recognized. And the moon up in the afternoon. Perhaps the present is only the past gnawing its way into the future, so that our day does not exist at all. No, no, you say, it's simply over. The instant of late sun on my hands feels worth two birds out of reach, on which the cat's attraction, attention is riveted. My attention wanders, not by loops and jumps, but alternate diffusion and concentration, like the foot of a snail. And if thinking, as if thinking were a method of scratching on these clumps of earth, and I could grab a fistful in order to hold on, the way I press words deep into the paper. Do I hope the breaks between them will interrupt, if not beat time? The way thinking of the cows enlarges this small plot into a plane, because cows move slowly and in the distance. Wittgenstein claims words are not essential to what we call language. And it's true in the tweets of birds much is meant and understood. But did he not recognize connective tissue, even though he had skin covering his whole body? Of course, he also thought he could have a toothache without teeth. This opinion does not depend on the direction of time and so won't upset the flight of birds, you say, nor keep the cat from contracting her pupils to remove their picture. I chase my little thoughts around a circle the way the cat changes, chases her tail. So more often, she leaps into the nick of the kill. Once upon a time, I spoke my mother tongue, lake, pond, deep river, sea. And the wake of a ship showed not only the churn of water behind it, 
but the yet unrealized advance about to happen. Then, suddenly, I was an old woman, enveloped by evening cool. The waning light, damp on the skin, makes the yard less spacious, less direct than the remembered garden. I'm not a virtuoso of stillness like the cat, but feel the lightness born of fatigue, of words that say nothing but hang in the air like echoes, or positive joy. And last, I will read from the sequence Rehearsing the Symptoms. Wanting. Wanting always the possibility of this body, thinking it here, in anxiety, in fear, but wanting to want the light never to stop. Caught between wanting and acting, between language and landscape, wanting to contain volumes, multitudes, curves to everywhere, describing circles of light, flashes of lightning. Wanting the body visible from head to toe and without secret, a nakedness without debt, believing it possible, the light as event, thinking to want to think as if in response. Doubting I love while knowing I've wanted to, thinking to console myself by describing veins in a block of marble, as if seeing a reason for seeing. Fearing to exist without really living, absence of body within the body, wanting to be able to suffer, to look at the dark, the mass of night that surrounds or is myself. Thinking of the body, here without thinking, not knowing how to think, swimming without fatigue, as if without body, in a sea without water, without end. And the next one is thinking. I don't think I know how to go about it. I sit at the edge of the water as if it were the right place for learning to think, as if it were enough to sway with the current or indecision, stay, walk away, give in to the sand dunes fading and, fall, and fading and failing, sorry, fading and falling or a quick push upright. If I can't walk, might I yet, like Parkinson patients, be able to dance? My brain's incessant activity seems fruitless. It can't be thinking. I put it on paper to encounter it outside myself, an obstacle, a wall with a grain, with pores where I might discover a pattern. Then I'm recalled to my body by legs as if pricked by needles. How can I think when I can't even see night falling swiftly, shifting around me like water? Can one look at nothing and hope for help? Is it a matter of rocking with the dark, monotonously? 
But I am speeding or slowing down the long lane where thinking gets lost in layers of dust, failing precision, failing to see, to embrace. The gulls circling, the vast empty space, traffic noise borne in on the wind. Should I take off my clothes, nudity meaning power? But would I know my body scattered among memories, impossible to hold in the mind all at once? If I let the night invade my eyes all the way to the horizon, as if it had a body, might I then see the cause of my not seeing? It might be a beginning. And the next one is called Escaping Analogy. I thought everyone likes a good likeness and cultivated analogies to, to fill the emptiness within. You cultivated the occipital cortex in the rear of the brain which guides attention to the visual world. You dislike the net of, this reminds me of, that I let spread to the infinite. So my universe has slowed as predicted, and lack of cartilage in my joints acts as a restraint on motion. You don't mind that analogies make the air transparent for things not in front of our eyes, but that these manifestations of the incorporeal keep you from seeing what you see, blot out the body. Your mother's, for instance, whose both eyes were fixed on the hidden side of the mirror and whose mind stood apart. You want to be shattered by the cry of the blue jay, the scent of lilac, want to see even if it's Bank of America lettered on a one-story brick building because, you say, reality is always in doubt. And so you take abstraction for granted and play among symbols. You keep firm hold of your hand in order to feel it touch the sheet of paper, the pen, to see that your fingers are long and thin and the nails clean. You would allow all things their own weight and value, but know that they only appear solid, that the elements keep reverting to metaphor, so that when you said in a moment of distraction, I am flying by the seat of my pants, you furtively checked if they were zipped. I admit that analogies may settle into an economy of reflex and moreover contradict one another. Still, I enjoy placing their overlappings next to one another, letting the contradictions face outward as in a game of dominoes. But now I've seen a pain in your face that isn't like anything else. It has left me shattered because it seems to belong entirely to itself, to have its own dimension, I am unable to understand, as if trying to hold a mirror to what has no image. When you try to talk about your pain, it's as if you had to speak a foreign language and the words are forgotten a moment before they are uttered. In that language, you remember all the bookstores you've been in, all the changes of seasons back to your birth. From that distance, you tell me you once had a German wife. My grammar falls short of these horizons. And I don't know if I should tell you, I am that German wife. And I'll close with one called doing. I often don't know what to do. Or 
if I want to. Dawn has long broken while I still drag my feet in the mud inside my head, hope for coffee, make a B-flat moan to prepare the plunge into action. Or not. Maybe I want to cast only a passing shadow, feel like my mother's thank God when she took off her corset. But I'm worried there's something I ought to be doing, afraid I'll die without having done anything, realized myself, you call it. But wouldn't that just mean limited myself? A cement mixer stuck in the motion, even if it helps build a house? So I delude myself into thinking I'm doing something when thinking or when descending into the night with the cat and the dreams of the cat. You say, no doing without sweat of the face, thorns and thistles and bringing forth children. Should I look instead of worrying about fine distinctions that escape my eyes? Listen instead of fretting about the size of my ears? But can I cultivate my garden without becoming a cabbage head? The hand gets ready to write. Could we call this manual labor? A stage in the great work of rendering the corporeal cat incorporeal while giving her body to the bodiless word? even if it's from despairing of my own body? You say, my writing is so slow, it's more like gravitational condensation or dust gathering on the cleaning supplies. It's true, I'm dawdling, as if I had time to watch the formation of geological layers, though night already seeps through my brittle bones. I certainly don't know what to do to end my days gracefully. But the body dies all through our life. Thousands of cells every second. So everything should be very clear. Thank you. Thank you so, so much to both of you, to all three of you. Um, I guess before we see if there are any questions from the audience, I want to make sure that the three of you have the chance to <laughs> talk amongst yourselves. Um, there's so many interconnections between your work and obviously influence as well. So I don't know, Ingrid or Rosemary or Renee, if <laughs> after all that. You're just going to put us on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> Some ideas. Yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm still soaking it all in, but I actually was very interested. I didn't know that you had studied philosophy. That's right. And it's very funny because I didn't study philosophy in school, but when I started being interested later, I think that's when I was like, eh, I like poetry. <laughs> so, but I'm still, it's funny. I think that's a very good tie between the three, and I don't think I would have identified it. But. We can just open it up to <laughs> questions from the audience, too. I'm sure there are some. Or everyone's just spellbound and needs a moment. Yeah, right in the middle here. And there are some microphones that will come your, come your way. I just wanted to ask about gerunds. 
because I heard so many of them, those ing words, um, Renee, so many really incantatory in your poems. And then there were poems uh, like thinking and, and doing from you, Rosemary, um, Jeff, forgive me, the familiarity of the first names. Um, uh, and so, so yeah, what those words are, they're in between nouns and verbs. How, how do you use them? How do you think about them? Do you want to talk about Jared's? <laughs> Jared's. Um. Well, actually, uh, the this, this sequ this sequence, um, rehearsing the symptoms, is, um, was in inspired by a book by a French philosopher called Emmanuel Fournier. And, um, and, and, it, and his book is called Croire, Devoir, Penser. So to, uh, to, to believe, to want, to think. And his, this is an altogether remarkable book because um, it is all written with infinitives. And uh, all his sentences are, are go like to do, to do, to to want, to think, to, and uh, and he keeps that up for three hundred pages, <laughs> you know? um, and uh, that uh, that book stunned me, and uh, and I thought of uh, so I thought hmm, maybe I should try to do something like that with all the infinitives, and the infinitives didn't really work. Uh, because the two, two, two just got too much. And that was actually what drove me to the gerunds <laughs> of this sequence. I don't, um, I don't think I, I ever sit thinking I want to use gerunds, but, but I think um, I love liminal, as, as I said, uh, spaces crossing. And I think uh, when I'm trying to build a sentence lately, um, I, I've said many places and many times that the once I started doing these drawings, which are abstract and have um, sort of like a look like script in them and also architecture, it sort of changed the way that I um, changed my sense of the limits of the sentence. Um, or even not even sort of consciously, but just made me behave differently in sentences. And I think that I got really excited about uh, the expansion and being able to kind of, you know, use the semicolon as a sort of like a turning of a corner uh, and sort of like to keep circling or to keep turning. And, and I think, you know, the Jaren obviously helps with that. It helps to keep, um, keep moving and keep a sense that uh, like a process is, is happening. Um, but I would love for you to address that question in, in terms of, of photography and capture and if you had thoughts about that as well. So this is someone who's never studied any of this. Is a gerund just an ing doing presentness? I don't know what this is, <laughs> I just have to admit it. Is that what that yeah, is? I, yeah, go with that. I don't, yeah, go with that, great definition. Um, it's interesting, I had never heard of it, but thinking of it, um, there was so much talk about presentness, and I think that's very, I mean, I think so much about time um, in my work, but I think it is about kind of just the direct experience and kind of measuring, um, I don't know, it's, I think you, like the, the it's, I don't know. I don't have much to say about it other than like presentness, I think is very important to me, whether it's bringing the past into the present um, or not, but I guess it is like there's an activity to being, and I think that's always like in the work. In, in your incredible introduction, thank you by the way, mm -hmm. you talked about the, the excerpt, and, um, and I think that I've heard you do, to talk about the, the images that are uh, upstairs uh, in that way, but I also think of it as like a kind of uh, when I look at your photographs, it feels like because of the layering and, and all, also the sort of like bisection or the interruption that the different parts of the image um, play, it, f it feels to me like a kind of ongoingness or an, an incompletedness that is, 
that has that, that quality of the, the ing, that, that it's, um, and you could t talk about it as presentness, but to me it feels more about a, a sense of there, like there is no, there's no end or there's no beginning in, in the, in the, I was gonna say the drawings, in the, in the images that, um, so yeah, I think that there's a, that's a really great way to sort of see that in your, in your work. Funny, this, this exhibition was the moment that I think just the amount of time that we had to work with it because of pandemic timing um, was the moment that I s titled the series and their Dura pictures duration. Mm -hmm. um, but the through line and the dates, it's funny, they actually probably could be undated, but it marks the moment the photograph was taken. But I also I've always given myself permission to reprint photographs in a different context if I want to. So they're always ongoing. I'm always looking to 2012 when I'm in today. So it's really interesting. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question for Rosemary. Um, can you talk about, um, so I've read, I can't remember, what's the title of the, the blue book the, that came out most recently? Uh, the Nick of Time. Nick of Time. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, just about the trajectory of uh, reproduction of profiles to Nick, Nick of Time, and that's probably like 30, five years of, of time. Um, I'm just interested in, can you talk about just the, the way in which your approach to sort of thinking philosophy, philosophically within the poem or using the poem to do that kind of thinking has changed over this time or? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not really aware of it, I must say. Um, I think the body has become more and more important for me, and, and this is another uh, link, I think, between us. Um, and while, while working with abstraction all the time, I mean, we're using language all the time, you know, um, and th that being really our element beside time, you know, um, you know the body, is more and more important for me. And, you know, it started actually with um, a, po a point after being out of schools. Um, in the German high school I went to, uh, the body did not exist, <laughs> you know. There, there, was, uh, there was nothing but uh, thought, <laughs> thinking. And so discovering the body, that was actually a great discovery. Uh, and you know to discover that, for instance, uh, Valérie says um, the, um, the that the mind is this superficial little layer that rests on the important thing, the body. Uh, you know, so shocked me when I first read it. You know, it turned upside down all I had ever heard before, um, and it was a great liberation and. And of course, as I get older, the body demands more and more attention <laughs> anyway. So, you know, as the body falls apart, I invoke it more, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, but in a way, you know, otherwise, I don't know if my thinking has changed much. You know. I would hope a little, <laughs> you know, but... Um. One thing I noticed that felt really different is the the earlier work. There's it, there's a lot of sort of propositional um, thinking, like kind of um, suggesting like scenarios, almost like a kind of conversation that's being uh, um, written into the piece, or like a kind of you suggest a sort of thought, like a almost a call and response sort of thing, which is still present. Yeah. But one thing that felt diff feels different is 
time does feel like so much more of a texture in the latter pieces mm -hmm. than um, the others felt almost more abstract, but these feel more daily albums. Well, well you know, the, the poems that you referred to, uh, um, I, got, I can't remember the, my titles of my own book. <laughs> you see what age does to you? <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, the, the two books... Um, reproduction. Reproduction of profiles. <laughs> and yes, uh, are all really a dialogue with Wittgenstein. You know, I was in, in the reproduction of profiles, it was with the Tractatus and in the other with philosophical investigations. And uh, I, I read him and just let, let him spark what, what he wanted to, but also often took his sentences and put other words, his sentence structures and put other words in it and such. So there is, there is a stress on, uh, on the, well, on the philosophical statement and the proposition. But again, you know, trying to pit the body against that. Yeah. Yeah, in front here. Uh, I want, wanted to thank Renee for warning us that we might get tired if we tried to listen to the work as linearly. I found it a, energizing somehow, like a challenge. Um, and I, it, I bounced back to that while I was listening to Rosemary um, and her image of imagining one had the time to observe ge geographic strata. And I, so that made me want to ask, uh, particularly because of the repetition about your, the way you do that, Renee, the way you maybe approach it every day, it seems like it's very methodical. If you could just make a comment on that. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if it's methodical as much as um, it, it has something to do with uh, drawing through the body. Uh, I, I have to say my one of my very first loves in literature was Henry James. And when I first started writing I, um, like my early books, I really felt like I was conjuring, I, uh, I really wanted to write that long um, sentence in which um, I felt like he was writing at a time where he, he d didn't have the, those like corn words that kind of eliminate the need to say very much. Um, and and so he has to write kind of elaborately around something in order to demonstrate what the feeling is or what the emotion is. And I always wanted to do that, and I tried very hard, but my sentences just, they couldn't grow like that. They couldn't expand that way. And so um, 30 years later, um, having drawn, it really did uh, change my sense of, of the space of, of writing and being in the sentence. And it, it feels, uh, it's organic to me. It doesn't feel like, um, you know, if I try to write this sentence, I think it would be hard, but it's, it's just the way that I am experienced. Like I finally arrived at this, this way of, of experience, the duration of, of writing. That's um, one of the things that's most exciting to me about writing is, is the thinking about the body writing, thinking about what the body is doing, what's surrounding the body, but also, I, I mean, I just love to write about writing and write about drawing. Uh, so I guess I'm really interested in process. And I think that that, be, that interest leads to this kind of work where I am kind of circling an idea. It's like the, the circling, becomes the thing that I'm trying to write. Um, you know, the, the book of, uh, the Calamities is this book of essays that they all sort of kind of fail. They sort of like drop off at the end. And I realized that a lot of that was me being interested in just the motor of thinking and the motor of trying versus actually trying to 
finish an argument or build an argument. So I just really love the the movement and the energy of thinking and processing itself. And, and I think I wouldn't be able to write this sentence had I not begun making these drawings that loop and they go back and they, they go up and down and, and darken. And, and, and I really think that, I mean, I don't think it utterly changed my relationship to sentence building. Thank you for that question. That makes me think of something, um, just because in my process, like as I'm making photographs at least, I almost have like I have a, a gesture, an idea that I'm thinking of when I begin, and then I almost have like a instinctual, like out of body experience when I'm actually working. I'm not really thinking, it's more doing and process, and um, it's very messy and tornado-like. and. Then I think the latter end of it, which is always the finishing kind of annoying part, but it winds up feeling something like editing. And I kind of wonder in terms of like your processing and doing and being present, but where does the, like how often do you like read through things and do they change a lot after you've done the initial kind of like thrust of the writing or something for both of you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, for me, I always feel that I think only on paper. <laughs> that it, I don't start thinking until I, I start putting the pen down on the paper and start writing and fiddling. And uh, but I also I, I feel things are never done. <laughs> and uh, each time I go back, I <laughs> rewrite everything. <laughs> you know. And so at, uh, at some point when uh, I really have to just let things go and say, now they're going to go into a book and then they're going to be out of my hair and I'm not going to go back to them. You know? but, um, but yeah, the, it, it, and that is a, you know, an extension of the present and uh, staying in that moment and staying and rewriting it rather than going on. You know? So I do like that a lot. I think that's really funny because the, the way that I started taking photographs, um, I hated digital photography, but the distance of film allowed me not to edit immediately. Because uh -huh. so, otherwise I would do the same thing. And I was like, no, nah, not that, not that, not that. But the distance of like just even like a couple days and not being able to do it right away, I think otherwise I would rewrite everything. <laughs> there would never be anything made. So. I love that idea that, um, thinking for you be begins once you've made the contact with the paper. Um, I, f I feel that way too. I mean, I feel that there's something that begins when I begin. And, and if I'm lucky, which most of the time I have been um, with regard to writing, um, it, something grows and it, it's so ready to be what it is or to take me through whatever I'm going through that um, it, it, it happens and it's not, it's not super hard. And that doesn't mean I don't, I don't edit, but I'm usually very happy with the draft. And I know that if I am feeling joy, I know that what I'm writing is what I mean to be writing. And if I'm stuck, then I have to sort of stop and figure out what is going on. Like, why am I not being able to sort of fall into that space? And it's really interesting because I, um, that was true for decades, and now I feel that something is changing, and I have to have a, a, a different response to when it doesn't feel good because I don't think it's, it's the same. And that's something I'm learning about aging, that like something can be true for 40 years and then not be true anymore. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, over here. Um, so first of all, just a huge thank you for sharing your work with us this evening. It's been delightful to listen to. Um, my question is, is perhaps for Rosemary, but I, I would you know, very much welcome everyone to contribute to um, an answer. 
I was interested, Rosemary, in, in your relationship to the natural world, because the body seems to be, of course, you know, a, a very big subject in your work, but nature also seems to be very prominent, thinking about the, the blue jay calling in your poems, and there was one wonderful line which I think I've written down wrong, but it was something like, what was it? Can I look at a bird like I haven't learnt to read? And I just wondered if you could say something about your relationship to the natural world. Um, I'm very sorry, but I couldn't really hear you. My ears are also not functioning well. Could you speak, uh, say it again more loudly, please? Is this, is this kind of working? Yeah, so um, I was wondering if you could say something about your relationship to the natural world in your poetry and how you represent nature in your poems. Um, you know, I'm not aware that I'm, <laughs> I'm representing nature, <laughs> except for the, the body, really, the human body. Um, I don't have a great relation to the natural world, I must say. And that, that line, uh, you know, that I look at these things as if I were interested is actually sort of true for me. <laughs> you know? I, I do look, but... Uh, but but what I'm interested in is, is language, is words, you know. And it's through the words that I uh, connect with the natural world, you know. I guess I'm, I'm curious about performance, and um, it just strikes me it's been a long time since I've heard people read poetry, just given the pause we've taken from these events. and so. I guess I wonder, as writers, if you could talk a little bit about the reading of your work. I was so struck by both of your, you know, modes of delivery, and maybe, you know, Ingrid, you also talk about the way in which you sort of perform yourself in in your work and how that 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 functions for you. I I think it feels very different um, coming back. I don't know if we're back, but from Zoom. In, in 2021, it just felt like everything was Zoom, and, and I was actually really happy with that. Um, I love this, like, I feel really good about this part, and that was, <laughs> that was really cool. And, um, and also, like, having to give up my headphones I love the, like in Zoom, I always, whenever I did an event, I always have my, like my big headphones on and they became my security blanket, but you can't, you know, be up on the podium with, with that. Um, I don't know, I don't think, I, I wish that as writers, um, we thought more about um, performance. I don't, I don't think about it as much. I just want to, um, I want to have my breath, which I don't always have, so that I can um, kind of recreate the like my seriousness with regard to what I've written, like the the sort of the urgency for it or um, its importance to me. And so I love when I can breathe, and I can. Um, sometimes it's hard when I've written this work to engage the audience because if I look up I lose my place. I did a pretty good job for the first pieces and then the last piece I just got blind and overwhelmed. But I just I think um yeah I mean I I love to um present the work but it but it's it never feels like I'm adding an extra sort of you know an element of just sort of like trying to be present is is what i what I do. But it feels very different from writing. It's, it's something completely different, you know. Um, by the way, I apologize for my many stumblings, but it is a little bit the fault of that light. You know, it's, it's so little and down under. I had trouble sliding my book <laughs> so that I could actually see. Very know? modest, yeah. <laughs> you know? But uh, actually... Uh, Reading out loud um, makes one realize things about what one has written that you weren't aware of. And so I like very much to do it and try something out on an audience because you notice things that 
you, you shouldn't have done, you know. <laughs> and also, you know, um, and you, you get surprised uh, because the sound in the is, is quite different from the paper, you know. So. I was going to say the one thing. I won't talk much about my reading off a of paper, but I was happy when you reread something that I had written, and there was the one one or one space one, and I thought I did it right. <laughs> yes. Oh, you absolutely did it right. Because when you you're know. reading it, it's a visual poem, and you can see it. And then I thought, how do I say this? And it makes sense because right. it's not said right. space. You have to enunciate it like a quotation. Right. Or something. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was like a punctuation, a space enunciated, which is kind of perfect for the poem. Um, I think about, I don't know, in performance in my work, um, the images are performed for the camera, but it's not necessarily like a, a narrative performance or something, but I think the closest and most, I don't know, clear thing in my head in a response is something like um, the performance that the audience does, I think, is the more important thing to me in my work, at least at this point, um, in terms of like, you know, I've had such a pleasurable time watching people look at the work when they don't know I'm there and someone's <laughs> looking almost inside something. Um, and so I think it's kind of like setting up an, an activity for looking and the way that people do that differently, I think, is um, interesting to me. So. We, we did have a group today that were sort of moving their bodies to try to mimic or figure out in a kind of forensic bodily way how you made the images you made. So I think they... They do instigate a kind of contortion sometimes in the viewers, <laughs> yeah. which is probably a good response. Yeah. No, it's like the perfect. Anytime I get a different kind of bodily interaction with just looking, I think it's a great, um, a great moment. Can I ask you a question? Yes, anytime. Um, I was really interested. Um, I guess I want to know if you could talk about interiority in your work. I was thinking about the, I was really surprised by the, uh, I asked you about them, the, the, the sort of, I don't know what you call that, the, on, on the sculpture level, that the kind of. The vestibule. Vestibule. Um, and also the, there's another piece uh, that has like a, a, kind of a large photo inside of it. And, and both of them feel like you sort of have to kind of, almost like they don't want you to see them or for you to see them, you have to be brave enough to kind of like go through. And I was wondering if you could talk about that and, and how, that, how that plays out in, the, in the, the sculptural elements but also in the, in the images. I think um, there's such a complicated answer probably, but in terms of interiority, I think my my mission in this downstairs exhibition was thinking through a space where there are no walls and there's a lot of windows and a lot of visibility, even though it's an interior. From one outside, you can see completely through an inside to the other outside. Um, I wanted, and there's, you know, you could build an interior wall, you can do all these different things to kind of make the space different, but the given space is not interrupted. It's like a big, you know, atrium or something. So I think mm. the idea of slowing availability of information is really interesting to me. Um, and I think maybe, I don't know, interiority is just such an interesting, that's like, that's the problem that I was solving with that. But I think, um, I mean, the images are all like really constricted interiors and I make work inside. I don't leave my studio. I feel very like, you know, I was a pandemic happy Zoom person, you know, so I think it is just a part of the work um, that winds up, I don't know, I think a lot of my work recently has been about exaggerating natural tendencies or something. And so I think that's one of those is exaggerating the space at the same time that I'm exaggerating that element in the work, um, protective and exaggerating, so. Yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question in the audience? Maybe a last question. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. That was amazing. Amazing reading. Um, my question is, it's kind of a big question. What is your relationship to abstraction 
And here I'm thinking about what Rene said um, about being a philosophy major. And I'm thinking about how philosophy in, <sighs> there's very different, many different kinds of philosophy, but the way that it's typically taught is very um, masculine and white supremacist and that mode of abstraction seems to be kind of disconnected from systems of oppression and from the body and imagines this universal that doesn't really exist, right? So I'm wondering how you think of abstraction um, probably differently from that, right? I think I would call I would call the part that was very hard for me in philosophy like it it that it wasn't abstraction that was hard it was um what's the opposite of abstraction it was the it was the canon and it was the it was the way in which it just um it didn't for me feel that there was just no, there was no evidence of m me, like any of my identities in any of the things that we were studying. And while many of the things we were studying were interesting and sort of led to my thinking, and I, and I have a lot of those things still with me in, in this sort of vague, wonderful relation, I, I really did want to figure out a space in which I could um, think about things like time and, and experience and memory and knowledge and knowing uh, where I had more control over it um, or had more say or more like I could just see myself doing those things. Um, abstraction to me uh, is just this beautiful Thing. I don't even know, uh, I haven't really tried to explain my love of it. For, for example, in my drawings there's a lot of math. I was a terrible math student, but I just, I love the way math looks. I love equations and formulas. And, and, and I think what, and to put that sort of like next to a, a, a thin line or like a color does something, but, but I love the, the feeling of thought as as like a subject and not necessarily pointing to something because that kind of takes you away from the from the that um, the energy of that so I just love I love process and I love figuration I prefer it when it's invented or if I don't know what it's about um, but so abstraction is something that I've I've sort of always kind of held on to because it allows you to think about something um, almost kind of like mechanically without having to um, get pulled into other things that are, are not it, um, which is why I loved this notion of drawing, writing without having to write, without having to make what I was drawing become an, an, a story. I could draw this language that, that couldn't be read and thus I could be drawing and thinking about what it means to write by doing this thing with my hand. And so I, I love that, sort of being to pull something out of something very complicated to look at something complicated but, but almost simply or like bodily, if that answers the question. Abstraction. You have a book called Driven to Abstraction. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You're an expert. Yeah, well, it's all in my poetry, I think. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I will say that I really do think that, um, I mean, I, I recognize that you were in conversation with Wittgenstein's Tractatus in, in that book, and that was one of the books that I loved from philosophy. Um, but, but I did really feel that there was a way in which reading your work um, showed how abstraction could be a, like a place of, um, like a generative place, a place of production, as opposed to a kind of like 
reiteration of something that you've learned or practiced or Yes, but you know, um, I'm not a great reader of philosophy. I'm on, only, I only read those that write well, you know. And, you know, and, and Wittgenstein writes very well, so he got, he got me, you know. <laughs> you know? And um, yeah, so it wasn't abstraction as such. Uh, the other thing, actually, that um, that interested me um, in working with. Um, propositions uh, was that before that I had written these poems that were very skinny down the line and always had the object of a supposed sentence tumble into being the, the the object tumbles into being the subject of the next phrase. So it's like two eyes see always two different questions, two don't always need to be answered or something like that. You know? And um, and I loved it for the speed. You know, it was exhilarating. It, 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 there is no period anywhere, and but it's never a real sentence. So there is both interruption and flow, which was which I liked. But after a while, I got tired of it, and be, you know, began to hanker for complex sentences, <laughs> you know, and uh, and decided to go to the other extreme and like take propositions also with their closure. And that's where Wittgenstein was, um, you know, the great source, you know, uh, playing with his Tractatus, uh, was exhilarating in a different way, you know. So there was that, uh, you know, rather than, rather than what he says in the philosophy. You know. yeah. Do you want to talk about abstraction? I feel like it's a pretty operative yes, it is thing right. in your work. <laughs> I mean, the thing that I'm thinking of is probably diverting from myself talking about it, but I'm curious, it's, I think, through my own lens that is making this question come up, but when I think of abstraction, the one that I'm most interested in is, it's all broad, but reduction. And I wonder in terms of like thinking of production and doing and repetition and it goes back to my editing question, the fact that you're very happy with things. Where does the like reduction of information come in and or like what other kinds of abstraction are interesting, you know, because I guess you can also overload information and that's a different kind of abstraction, but usually it's, I don't know, I think of it as like a lack of specificity, lack of um, maybe subject or these kind of things. And I'm just interested, I guess, in both of your approaches, like if there is a, all of it, every kind of abstraction, or if there's something that you're like, yes, I'm like, I'm, I like reduction. <laughs> but, I don't know. I would, I would never call it reduction, but I, I love, uh, I've been talking a lot about fictional knowing, and that's my favorite thing right now. I'm writing a book called um, When Notations, and it's written from the perspective of Anna Petova, who's a, was an architect and now a writer in Ravika. Cool place, you should go. Um, and what I love so much is that um, just being able to uh, write with expertise, and for me, I don't try to find out how to talk about wind. Um, I write what I think would be interesting. So there's just a, there's a lot of words like vector and turbulence and repetition, repetition of vector, vector. And when I read it, it makes me laugh. So I know that I'm on the right track. But, um, but I just love making up stuff. It's just more fun to me. I know that research is real and, and wonderful and I support it. But I also <laughs> love just making it up and lying, and like I just really love that stuff. Well, I think it's funny, because right before you said it, I was thinking, I wonder if you have an approach to abstraction that's related to lying or something, you know? And I think like that's so interesting, yeah, like when you're making it up. Yeah. It's so fun. <laughs> that's what you all get to do, and thank you for doing it. So. Okay, well, thank you so, so very much, thank and you thank you all for coming.